Microsoft killed the most iconic era screen in PC history. Intel yeeted its CEO mid-strategy and he's a little upset he's spaghetti about the whole thing. Commodore, yep, that Commodore, it's back from the grave. And Nvidia, oh boy, they're shoving 24 gigs of VRAM into a GPU that still calls itself mid-range. You know the drill, let's get into it. That's right, after 40 years of blue panic screens ruining your day, Microsoft just made it black. You're still crashing, it's just got a couple more vibes attached to it. Let's check it out. That's right, the blue screen of death, it's dying. They're putting it out to pasture and they're replacing it with something that is just, it's an abomination, really. And I actually have a few technical issues with replacing the blue screen of death in the way that Microsoft is planning on doing it. I'll get into that. But first off, let's get into the news. Say goodbye to Microsoft's iconic blue screen of death. It's being replaced by a more simpler all black alternative. Now, this blue screen united us in fear and chaos. You didn't quite know what the error codes meant. Then they added QR codes. Well, they're changing it again. Again, this time, no more blue screen. Microsoft's blue screen of death has served us for nearly 40 years and its replacement doesn't seem like a worthy one. 40 years, my goodness gracious. Does anyone else feel old? I know that I sure do. The Microsoft BSOD holds great memories for all of us, mainly since when you ran into it, you knew something was wrong. The screen's created moments of horror for several of us out there, but most importantly, it put us in situations that uh, means either spending money out of pocket or getting involved in hours or days of troubleshooting and figuring out what the heck's going on with your computer. Let's be honest here. This is a visual update. Under the hood, your system, it still crashes just as hard. It's just a visual update here. But they removed a few things that have me kind of scratching my head. And we'll get to that in a second. Microsoft says that their next round of Windows updates will make the platform enterprise ready. And the changes in the UI reflect a broader strategy of easily navigating unexpected restarts. Although we're unable to figure out how the change in UI helps with this motive. I guess that maybe the blue screen was a little bit too harsh. Well, I don't know. No. So you'll be seeing this soon because the next Windows 11 update is going to include that UI most likely, which improves readability and aligns better with Windows 11 design principles. Now that sounds optimistic, but when you look at the replacement for the blue screen of death, there's a couple questions that I have. Here it is in all its glory, the BSOD, the black screen of death. Now, what's interesting about this is Microsoft removed the QR code. You'll remember on the blue screen of death, you had this QR code that would show up on the screen. You could scan it and maybe find some information about your crash. And this is why I think this might be somewhat of a mistake to remove this. You know, removing the QR code might actually hurt less tech savvy users, in my opinion at least. That was, you know, a somewhat quick way to look up issues. Microsoft hasn't specified what update the BSOD will phase out. However, it's gonna come out in the next one most likely. All signs point to the next Windows 11 update is going to kill the blue screen of death for you. I'm, I'm sorry to be the guy to tell you. Now, here's a little conspiracy theory or a prediction rather. I think, I give it maybe two weeks <laughs> before someone out there makes a mod where you get a blue screen just to keep the vibes intact. I feel like that's a thing that the internet would do. Rip to a real one, the blue screen of death's going away. If you miss the blue screen of death, I mean, maybe you may wanna just like and subscribe on this video. Why? I don't know, vibes or whatever. All right guys, today's video is sponsored by <laughs> Meta PCs. Now full disclosure, Meta PCs is my company. We build custom and pre-built systems right here in the US and we just dropped a limited release that I'm actually pretty hyped about. We teamed up with Silverstone for a special run of the FLP-01. It's a compact, retro-inspired case that gives off some serious throwback vibes, but inside, it's got modern power. Ryzen 7 7800X 3D, 32 gigs of DDR5 memory, and the brand new RTX 5070 Ti. Whether you're gaming, streaming, or doing creative work, this thing absolutely rips. So if you're into retro tech, but you don't want to sacrifice performance, we built this for you. And it's not a massive production run either. We only have a limited number available, and they're ready to ship now at metapcs.com. All metapcs come with lifetime support from actual humans based right here in Phoenix, Arizona. No outsourced call centers, no runaround. Our team is on site, in house, and we're obsessed with making sure you love your system. Just check out our five star Google reviews to see what people are saying. So if you want a machine that turns heads and chews through frames, hit the link in the description, grab one before they're gone. And now back to the news. All right, this one's kind of cool. I'm a big fan of this. Commodore just got bought by a retro YouTuber, and he might actually do it justice this time. Let's take a peek. How much does it cost to buy Commodore? Low seven figures. So millions were spent on this. We'll see if it pays off. Commodore acquired for a low seven figure price. The new acting CEO comes from the retro community. While funding is being organized, tech tuber Perry Fractic ropes in lots of big Commodore names from yesteryear to build new hope. In fact, I was looking at uh, the video that he released on his channel and right up front, one of the actors from Silicon Valley apparently is involved in this. So he's pulling out all the stops to make this fun 
funding happen and to get some hype built around this. So what does he have in mind with relaunching Commodore, an old, old brand? Well, let's take a look. Now, quick side note, my dad actually came to the Meta PC studio last year and he was talking about how I got started in computers. There's a short form video, it's on my TikTok and all that good stuff. But he mentions how I got started. My first system was a Commodore 64, so. It all started with the Commodore 64. You know, I've got some nostalgia tied up in this as well. All right, let's dig into it. YouTube's Perry Frantic claims to be the acting CEO of the Commodore Corporation. Now, this is a surprise buyout deal. No one really saw this coming and uh, it was hinted at, but it seems to actually have gone through and put into motion. In a new episode on one of the rebranded Retro Recipes Commodore channel, Perry Frantic provides details of the seven-figure deal and outlines what his vision is for the company. Now, he's also got a bunch of ex-Commodore luminaries signed up to be part of this relaunch and give their input and also help the brand to uh, fire back up, which is kind of cool. And this is where things get really fun. There's some new hardware being teased. Now, while this is really exciting, the financing for the deal, still not certain. A key point from his video on his channel, which you should go check out, give it a watch. He's got a great channel and I like what he's trying to do here. I think it's very noble. Perry Frantic signed a share purchase agreement with the previous owners of Commodore. It's been agreed that a price in the low seven figures will be paid to seal the deal. So anywhere between a million and five million bucks for this thing. And he's got a lot of people backing this project, including Perry Frantic himself. Uh, he's already put in lots of cash to make the buyout happen, taking out second mortgages, selling the family silver, etc. However, the search is still on for angel investors to launch the new ship. Lots of details and discussion about funding are provided, but left us wondering what would happen if you can't find enough suitable investors to make the deal go through. All right, so who's he got signed up for this venture? Who's he got onboarded to get people excited? Well, he's got Bill Hurd, who's a Commodore pioneer, Albert Charpentier. They have the father of the Commodore 64, the czar of the VIC-20, tech support manager at Commodore, an XVP and legacy advisor, demo and convention facilitator, and a PR officer. Now, I'm a big fan of what he's trying to do, but there are some skeptics that have come out and said critics are going to chime in and say this will never be the original Commodore. In his defense, the retro tech enthusiast says, what if we got 47 trademarks from 1982 or original Commodore engineers back? Original executives, assistants, ROMs, Amiga. I mean, at some point, it does start to become the real Commodore, right? So he's really gone out of his way to try to surround himself with people who were familiar with building the original Commodore brand, which is kind of cool. He didn't go hire a bunch of new execs from new tech companies to come in and put their DNA into it. He really wants to pay tribute and ode to the original Commodore. And hey, if you're looking for a job, guess what? He is actually looking to bring some new blood into the company in some roles that actually make a lot of sense. He's, you know, as well as trying to get the financial backing, he's looking for other talented people, merchandise designers, social media manager, anyone who owns a license from the classic 1980s or 90s games should get in touch with the new acting Commodore CEO. So this isn't just a license flip. These people actually give a damn about the Commodore name, which is kind of fun. Now, Parafrantic's whole brand is loving old tech. He's not here to NFT the Commodore 64, or make another Bluetooth boombox. He's actually trying to do something unique with this thing. And he actually has a good opportunity to make this sort of a retro revival of sorts if things go well, if he does it right. It's not just about aesthetics, it can't be. It's also gotta be about actual usability. You know, I think if they blend old school design with, you know, some new internals, you think of uh, the potential, like outside of just emulation, you know, you could do like dev kits, legit productivity tools with a soul. There's a million ways you could take this. So for one, I'm pretty excited about it. I'm curious to see what you guys think about this. It's still very early in the process, but it's something that I wanted to talk about because I think it's kind of a cool idea. And I mean, worst case scenario, if things don't go well on this, it's still better than the endless graveyard of corporate cash grab reboots. So for one, I'm on board. I hope it goes well. Let me know what you think down in the comments below. All right, so Intel fired their CEO a while back mid rebuild and nobody's sure if it's that was a bold move or maybe it's just lending to this disaster in slow motion. Intel's former CEO has something to say about it though. Let's check it out. Intel's ousted CEO, Pat Gelsinger says he wasn't allowed to finish what he started. He claims the decision to step down was forced by external powers, AKA I would imagine the board had something to do with it. Intel's former CEO, Pat Gelsinger says he couldn't complete his ambitions for Intel Foundry and his iconic IDM 2.0 strategy. And for those who don't know, IDM was, uh, it's kind of like what TSMC does for AMD and Apple. Intel wanted to not just design their own chips, but they wanted to start making chips for other companies and other corporations. Based on Gelsinger's projections with IDM 2.0, when a strategy 
was announced, it was claimed that the Intel Foundry would ultimately meet industry competitions from, you guessed it, TSMC by the next decade. It seems like he ran out of time though. He never got to see that all the way to fruition. Now, this is also the guy that kind of brought us those ARC graphics cards, which amongst budget crowds were actually kind of a hit. You know, especially the Battle Mage cards, if supply weren't such an issue, the early Intel ARC GPUs did have some driver issues, but amazing DirectX 12 support. There were a lot of things to like about those cards. The price was right on them, and people that especially got the Battle Mage cards have been pretty vocal about their support. You meet a Battle Mage user who has a Battle Mage GPU, they won't hesitate to talk to you about them, which I think is great. We need more competition. That's the only thing that's going to help in this industry. If we have more competition, especially on the GPU side, NVIDIA is doing really well with their AI stuff and business side. So it's nice to see companies like AMD and Intel try to step up to that, especially on the budget side, which NVIDIA has all but ignored. I mean, look at the 50-50. What is that? What are we doing? It launches literally tomorrow. Cool. Now, Gelsinger's statement was, he said, you know what? This was a difficult decision to step down. I wanted to finish, but I wasn't given the opportunity. So that means the decision was made by a third party for him. That's what he's saying. Although he didn't say who it was, you can probably guess it. The third party is Intel's board of directors. Was he on to something or not? Well, apart from the sluggish momentum that Intel saw with its consumer business under Gelsinger, the foundry division witnessed massive losses, not just financially, but in terms of market reputation. Now, Intel put out many nodes, but failed to grasp market attention, and they were limited to internal use only. They didn't deliver on its IDM 2.0 motive. Although Gelsinger had expressed in the past that Team Blue had huge expectations for 18A, but given his announcement, Intel's former CEO won't see it being launched under his tenure, at least. It, it'll be interesting to see what Intel does, because if they pivot away from manufacturing, that's a huge shift, and it basically gives more ground to TSMC. This is like the classic big business, publicly traded company dilemma, right? Because it could have been a case of vision versus reality. You know, the board wants earnings. They don't want long-term dreams. They're looking to make money today. So where's Intel now? Let's wrap it up with this. Under Intel's new CEO, Lip Bhutan, the firm is redirecting its momentum towards changes from the grassroots, which include large-scale layoffs. We've seen a bunch of those lately, extended use of third-party foundries, and a shift in Intel's approach towards the foundry division. Team Blue is set to initiate mass production of its 18A process soon and would likely show us what Gelsinger had been working on the past few years. So time will tell, but at the end of the day, the board wants profits right now, not tomorrow. So what are you gonna do? Now listen, Intel has had a lot of issues, 100%. Like I'm using AMD, I'm using a 9950X 3D in my system. I've switched away from Intel for the most part, but whether you liked him or not, Gelsinger, he was one of the few CEOs that had actual engineering chops, which is a little rare in tech today. So who knows what would have happened? What does Intel need to do to regain your trust? Let me know down below. NVIDIA is shoving 24 gigs of VRAM into a so-called mid-range card. Now, either this is genius or it's just flex bait. I'll let you decide. Let's dig into this. We've got some new leaks on new NVIDIA cards. Yep, new cards already. Nice. Nice. NVIDIA is also planning GeForce RTX 5070 Ti Super with 24 gigs of GDDR7 memory. Now we've already seen some rumors and leaks about some super cards coming out, right? Not just the 5080 Super, which we've covered before, or the 5070 Super that NVIDIA is reportedly working on. Just hours after sharing the specs of the 5070 Super, Copite, one of the most reliable NVIDIA leakers, revealed that the company is also planning another card, the 5070 Ti Super. So let's talk about the specs on this 5070 Ti Super. It's kind of got me scratching my head a little bit. I'm curious to see what you guys think. Apparently the 5070 Ti Super is going to use a GB203 350 GPU with 8,960 CUDA cores. That's the same count as the current 5070 Ti. It's worth noting that the last gen Super Refresh brought only minor improvements to the Ti tier and this generation may follow the same pattern. All right, so there's an important update to the memory config. While the card will still feature 28 gigabytes per second GDDR7 memory and a 256 memory bus, meaning there's no change in bandwidth. The capacity is increasing to 24 gigs. Now, I can't help but feel like this isn't a mid-tier card. It's not for a Fortnite rig. This is for people running stable diffusion in 4K, which brings me to my second thought, that this isn't really about FPS, right, on this card. At least I don't feel like it is. It's about pushing creator and AI workloads without calling it a workstation card. That's my personal opinion. That's what I feel like is happening here. And then just with the amount of SKUs that we're hearing about here, 58, 
80 super, 50 70 Ti super, 50 70 super. It kind of feels like Nvidia is just playing GPU roulette again. It's like they're trying to fill every $50 price gap between $600 and $1,200. So let's talk about power on this expected new card. We're talking about leaks that say the TDP will increase to 350 watts, which would be a 50 watt jump, placing it just 10 watts below the 5080. Now, a lot of people are saying, uh, okay, when's this gonna come out? When are we gonna start seeing these cards hit the shelves? A lot of people speculating it's not coming until CES. So you're months and months and months away. Best case, it hits before the holidays, but I just don't see that happening. I could be totally wrong though. <laughs> I don't know. So let me know what you guys think about this. I mean, the VRAM, that is actually, it's kind of a nice perk because if you're talking about smart future proofing, next gen games probably gonna demand a little bit more than uh, 16 gigs, or maybe it's just overkill. Let me know what you guys think down below. Some interesting leaks on this. Make sure that you uh, subscribe because we're gonna keep talking about this as we start to hear more. All right, guys, that's gonna do it for today. If you uh, if you want me to uh, talk about some other stuff this week, I've got a few more videos dropping. Hit me in the comments down below. Let me know what you think about this 5070 Ti Super with 24 gigs of GDDR7 memory. What an interesting move by NVIDIA. Let me know what you think down below. We'll see you next time.